segment five, security in the current administration. We will substantially have withdrawn from Iraq by the end of the summer. The administration <coughs> wants to begin drawing down our forces in Afghanistan in the course of that next year. It's placed the defense budget under current constant right. pressure. Against that, it's expanded the use of attacks from drones in Pakistan and Afghanistan some fivefold, and it got Osama bin Laden. What do you make of the Obama security, national security team? Well, again, I have to say, um, starting with my own department, um, I, I really have only praise for my successor. She has really continued largely, not entirely, but I'd say 95% of the approaches that we took uh, to Homeland Security. And I think she's been serious and, and she's been successful in doing that. I think more generally, um, over time, and I, I'm not sure it's, the administration takes it as a compliment, but the administration has really largely built upon and continued the policies of the, of the Bush administration, uh, both in terms of being willing to use military force, including unilaterally, as we mm -hmm. saw in, in, uh, in the case of bin Laden, uh, not closing Guantanamo, uh, you know, continuing to invest in some of the technologies and some of the techniques that we've used, even, by the way, defending the state secret privilege against uh, groups like the ACLU who always want to have, you know, national secrets uh, divulged. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, I want to I want to praise the continuity. And I've often said to people, you know, it's one thing when you're standing outside as a right. co candidate or as a critic, when you have the responsibility to protect American lives, it is remarkable how presidents of either party wind up <clears throat> having violent agreement about the need to take the necessary measures. Okay, so as a historical matter, well, the comparison <coughs> might be, I'll put this to you, Harry Truman sets in place the basic policy of containment. Right. In effect, he launches the Cold War by announcing that the United States will push back. Mm -hmm. Dwight Eisenhower comes along. There's some disagreement about Korea, but fundamentally, Dwight Eisenhower accepts the policy of containment. And now, and for the next 40 years, the Cold War is bipartisan, substantially bipartisan. Right. So is that what we've seen? George W. Bush gets hit with this thing, scrambles, does the best he can with it, brings in some excellent people in the second term, and the Obama administration has now made the war on Islamic, ex we still don't have a good name for it, right. but this thing is now bipartisan. And we all ought to be grateful for this, that the Obama people at least are realistic enough when they get to office to do what needs to be done. I think that's right. I think you that do. What, what has happened is uh, there's been a recognition of the fundamental nature of the threat, the fact that it's going to be with us for a long period of time. And basically the core of people who are making policy in both administrations, while there'll be some differences tactically, have the same basic strategic vision. Mm -hmm. And I think that the country ought to be grateful about that. Okay. Um, the Patriot Act of which you're credited everywhere in the, in the blogosphere right. as the co-author. Uh, <clears throat> this gets complicated very fast, but right. to deal with it, as, with it as simply as possible, <clears throat> there are three provisions that are set to expire this month of right. May. Uh, one covers roving wiretaps. Mm -hmm. There's a second provision that allows federal investigators to compel the production of business records. Uh, all right. What's interesting is, as I read it, the current administration, through Attorney General Holder, has provided a rather tepid uh, statement of support for extending these provisions, and all the action is taking place within the Republican Party. Uh, James Sensenbrenner, representative from Wisconsin, as I recall, has introduced legislation that would extend these provisions, right. and he's getting pushed back from the right. Alan West, conservative, beautifully eloquent man who's just been elected to Congress, former colonel in the Army, now representing Florida, and by anybody's standard, a thoroughgoing conservative says, I'm not so sure about this infringement on civil liberties. What the heck is going on? Well, you know, the, these things become uh, <clears throat> political footballs. And I, I remember occasions when I was criticized by people who said, well, how come you, you know, were involved in writing the Patriot Act? And then I'd say, well, what do you object to? And they'd say, well, because the Patriot Act authorized the war in Iraq. I'd say, well, it had nothing no, to do nothing with that. To do so sometimes the problem is the facts get lost in the rhetoric. So let's talk about these two provisions from a common sense standpoint. One is the ability to do roving wiretaps, which means if you're a, uh, a terrorist and you change phones, we can get a warrant to 
tap whatever phone you're using as opposed to having to go back each time for separate phones. Right. Now, here's the secret. We've done this for years with court blessing on drug dealers. Why would you allow us to do it on a marijuana dealer and not a terrorist? The issue about agents being able to get business records. Right. Well, right now, in a whole host of areas involving different kinds of frauds like bank frauds and uh, antitrust, agents can issue investigative demands for business records. Why would we let somebody in an antitrust case have to turn over business records but not a terrorist? Now, these things have existed for decades. The republic hasn't fallen. It hasn't been the end of democracy in America. If we could cool the rhetoric a little bit, I think in most of these areas, what people would see is that the provisions are actually common sense extensions of principles that have been around for decades and which the courts, liberal and conservative, have upheld. All right. Last question. <clears throat> if you could sit down the following two people and give each one a sentence of advice, what would you say? The Republican challenger in 2012, whoever he or she may be, and President Obama. Would you give them the same advice? Would you give them, what would you say? You know to what? Those I two would people? give them the same advice. And, what would I mean, it be? My, and my philosophy um, has been uh, to tr whether it's a Democrat or Republican, anybody who wants to ask me about national security, I'm willing to give them my advice honestly. And they may not like it, but they're going to hear it. What I would say is the challenge you're going to face going forward is that the adversary is ev evolving and changing. And therefore, we have to evolve and change. And most important, we have to be strategic about the threats we face, which means looking not only at the near-term threat, but to take the example of Pakistan, um, not only Pakistan in terms of, of al-Qaeda and the Taliban, but Pakistan in terms of China, and making sure we're not making decisions that will drive them towards the Chinese, and what the consequences of that would be in terms of our security in the region, both South Asia and the broader a uh, region of Asia. North Korea. You know, what are they doing with their uh, technology, their mm -hmm. cyber capabilities and their nuclear capabilities? So I, I would say this is much as you may not want to have to deal with national security issues and much as you might want to say we're done, we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish, you'll never be done. Uh, the end of the Cold War meant a world in which we'll have multifaceted threats, uh, we'll have ungoverned space, we'll be dealing with both high-tech and low-tech challenges, and if you accept the job as president, you're going to have to be able to develop and execute a strategy that deals comprehensively with all of these issues. Former Secretary of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff, you were kind enough to permit me to call you Michael, but I will say, Mr. Secretary, thank you. My pleasure. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Thanks for joining us.